Hi, everyone. I haven't done it for a while. Reverend Alice. Please sit down, Nikolai. Oh, thank you very much, Andreas and Hannah. That was a really nice introduction. Um, uh, we're so happy to be here and so happy to have you here, Nick. Uh, just a short introduction, yes. Uh, Andreas told you that uh, I'm a journalist. I was raised as an engineer, so I come from the technology point of view. I've uh, been studying innovation as a journalist. But what always interested me was how technology changes the world. And you all know that. So we're in the digital age. And this is what really happens right now. And this is a very good example that we have here tonight, Revolut, changing the world. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm, we're proud to say that Stockholm is one of the fintech hubs in, in, in the world. Uh, so it, it's about time that you came here, actually. <laughs> I think that's a good time. Uh, and um, before starting, um, I know that you are all Revolut users. So I was about to ask you if you're happy with your bank. Obviously, you are. <laughs> so I should ask you, uh, do you have another bank except for Revolut? How many of you have another bank except for Revolut? OK. Are you happy with that bank? How many? OK, so so. So uh, would you like to change bank completely? Uh, if there was a better alternative, how many? Oh, just a few. I think you got a market here. <laughs> Um, so that's interesting. Uh, it, it's interesting how this. Uh, okay, are we here? No. Coming and going. Okay, right. Uh, how, how the fi how the financial sector has been really changing in the short time. Could you please? Uh, most people know you, of course, but for those who don't know you, could you give us a short introduction, where, who you are, and why you started Revolut? Sure. So uh, my background uh, was, I would say, less tech, right? I, uh, I started my career as a trader in uh, Lehman Brothers, so many years ago, ages ago. Uh, and then, uh, so I always wanted to uh, build a company. And then, uh, as I was a trader, I was, you know, traveling abroad, uh, spending money, uh, sending money also abroad because I was an expert living in London. And then, uh, because I was a trader, I, I, I could, you know, quickly calculate, you know, how much I'm losing on every transaction, and it also, you know, pissed me off. So I decided to to sort it out for myself. So I ended up, you know, opening, you know, many bank accounts in, uh, you know, HSBC, Citigroup. Uh, didn't really work well uh, because they still charge a lot of commissions. So I decided to 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 build a business, a product that would uh, allow myself and you know other people to to, well, avoid uh, banking fees. So that's how it all started in 2015. So then, you know, we, we launched the product. I hired people, like, you know, for first time people we actually built the product within, uh, I would say, 12 months. It was in you know, a very buggy, um, and it was very childish, I would say, uh, compared to what it is now. Anyway, we, 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 we raised funding, you know, we pushed it uh, off, right? And, you know, we started slowly, you know, ga gaining user base. And then at later stage, I realized, you know, problems are not only with the transfers, or not only with the cut transactions abroad. There are problems in credit, problem in trading, problem in insurance, problem in mortgages, so problems everywhere where banks are. And then we started slowly solving you know, other problems. So uh, Hannah mentioned that we um, released commission-free trading. So that, you know, that's the uh, third or fourth problem that we solved. Uh, now working on a much cheaper credit compared to banks. And then, you know, slowly we were building the set of products which would allow users to have, uh, well, 10 times better products and then 10 times cheaper compared to banks. So that's, so that's the goal of Revolut. In general, we want to build a truly global bank and make sure uh, each person in every country can simply download up and open a bank account within one minute. So that's, that's the goal. Yeah? That's a good answer. Um, uh, better and cheaper and everywhere. That sounds like IKEA, kind of. <laughs> Another kind of business, though. Uh, you know, IKEA are passionate about, you know, um, coming to every country and solve the problem of that country uh, with their solution, kind of. Obviously, it became a large company. But there are a lot of smart people in fintech, lots of people who have been solving problems for some time, and a lot of really good technology people. So, I mean, that's not the whole answer to the question why you now, or why you're a country that is valued at $1.7 billion, right? And over 7 million users and uh, 1,200 1, co-workers, is that so? Yeah, 1,700, right? They're growing very quickly. So what did you do different from the other fintech companies that tried to solve this problem? 
what I do differently. Uh, I, I guess I was just you know more pushy, more aggressive, and more more smart in how we approach our know, problems, uh, and then uh, managed to scale much faster, right? So generally, in, tra in traditional uh, startups, so the way they operate, they have you know large product teams. So the way we set up organization is more like uh, we have you know many many startups within our big startup. So these small startups, they use our brand, right? They use our client base, they use our financial resources, they use our uh, compliance resources, our recruitment resources, but they build their own products with their own p &L, with their own metrics. So I guess that's allowed us to uh, scale fast and then you know, go in so many directions uh, instead of focusing traditional one. So kind of an ecosystem idea also, right? Yes, uh, ecosystem plus uh, yeah, ability to hire the best as well. So okay, and and, and yet there are some similar companies uh, like Monzo and N twenty six and companies like that start us. But what what what? How are you different from them? What's your greatest opportunity compared to to those companies? Yeah, I don't like these names. <laughs> <laughs> So let's 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 make sure just competitors go forward. <laughs> uh, well, generally, uh, um, so there are like you know quantitative metrics and non-quantitative, right? On the quantitative metrics in terms of you know revenue, or user growth, activity per customer, right? Um, we are number one, right? So that's you know I would say you know well publicly available data. Uh, non-quantitative metrics such as uh, ability to uh, ship. Right, brand name, uh, knowledge like you know of, of all people across the world about the brand. Again, I think we are uh, number one, although we can't uh, quantitatively uh, well prove it. So right uh, now, mm, making a startup company is about learning all the time, I guess. Um, so you must have some challenges and surprises during the first years of operation. Could you tell us a little bit what you learned? What was your biggest moments of, of learning and, and challenges that you learned from? I think we learn every day, right? It's uh, I, I can't really say that you know I learned everything. I think we're you know, just scratching the surface. I, I remember, like you know, when I started, like you know, four years ago, 2015, there were you know so many things that I haven't known, right? And then you know I, I purely operated from I would say first principles or logic, right? And then when you apply, you know, logic just based on information that you know, right? You you, you make some optimal decisions, right? And then uh, later you learn more, and then you realize that you know a lot of things you would uh, do differently. One of them, how you hire people, right? Um, another thing is how you scale other functions of the company, right? Because the reality is, the product is just you know top of the iceberg, right? So to to support top of the iceberg, you need to have you know um, a huge foundation, I would say, consisting of uh, I don't know, your platform, your recruitment, your people, your culture, and uh, like to put it simple, right? So we're now in uh, six products, right? So we have, you know, six product departments uh, with their own PNL, with their own resources. And these six product departments are actually supported by 12 internal product departments. So we build actually many more products for ourselves compared to what we build for uh, customers. For example, we take you know one uh, one department called finance, right? So within finance department, there is at least uh, twelve product teams focused on different products. One is affects market making, reconciliation, co banking system. My my only point is that to build you know one small product, it actually requires a huge foundation that you know people don't see. And to have that work well, of course, it's much about culture, as you said before, it's about yourself being aggressive, pushing, uh, but you also got to have a team that can support that rhythm, that, that pace of change. Um, and I, I know there's been some publicity, some new spaces about difficulties in the company, but what I would like to ask you is how, you obviously learn from that too, how do you build a human resource uh, department in a really fast-growing startup company that is modern and sustainable? How do you do that? Yeah, as, as I mentioned before, right, when, when you start uh, as a founder, you focus 100% on product and on shipping products, right? And then uh, what, what, what end up happening with this mentality are uh, other supporting internal functions, for example, as uh, people, we call it people department, not, not HR. They're just lacking resources. I mean, to give you an idea, uh, uh, 
so when we were, you know, I think, you know, 2015, we were 20, 30 people and, you know, not a single HR person, right? And then we grew grew up to 100, maybe 200 people, probably, you know, one HR, right? So this, this era, you know, was, was always uh, lacking. Now we have, like, probably 80 people in HR, which is kind of, you know, more in line with the, with the headcount. But generally, what, what tends to happen in, in startup world, when you scale fast, uh, you focus on um, fires that you think, you know, at value now, right? You don't really focus on, you know, long, long, longer term things like, uh, I don't know, consistent HR. So when you are more mature company, then uh, you have, you know, more resources to spend on HR and other things. I, I found that interesting that you say you prefer to call it the people department than an HR department. So that's kind of another focus than you usually have in an HR department. Could you develop on that? I just don't like the world human resources, right? It's like a very impersonal, right? And then uh, because we're a team, so we, we, we call it people, right? It's, uh, and then department is all about people. So within department, we have uh, two product teams and then you know, a lot of services teams. And then we make sure we track everything, starting from uh, culture, obviously, to, uh, to, to, to kind of, you know, what are behaviors in each team through, through different tools. We even track, like you know, whether you know people enjoy uh, working in the offices on, the, on a weekly basis, and then we assign you know these KPIs to again you know uh, office managers to make sure our offices are top quality. Now uh, about competition again, I personally think that uh, although I mean all banks have been kind of sleeping and are discovering that they were about to be challenged, and uh, suddenly they were and they're waking up, and, and uh, I must say that the Nordic banks are, in my eyes at least, uh, quite, kind of, you know, modern, trying to keep, a, keep, keep the pace, and they're implementing at least my bank, a traditional bank, uh, do, do, does have some app stuff which is similar to some fintech companies, what they've been offering, and, uh, you know, kind of trying to, to, to stick around. Um, uh, do you find the, 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 the bank industry in Sweden or in the Nordics being different from other parts of the world in, in that sense? Um, yeah, I think because you have a you know, great ecosystem here in terms of startups and tech talent, uh, plus uh, it's, it's more or less in you know, a cashless society, right? I think you know, digital is very developed in, um, in Nordics. So as a result, banks are also on average better compared to, say, US or Western Europe, especially Germany. Um, so that's, that's, that's true, what you say, right? Uh, on the other side, um, they don't have, you know, global ambition, really. They don't have, you know, ambition to build product, which, you know, covers many countries. As a result, like, uh, when you use just, you know, one uh, local bank, right? When you travel, when you, when, you, when you change country, you will not be able to have, you know, quick access to financial products in other countries. So that's, you know, a disadvantage. And generally, I believe fintechs are still, you know, better in, uh, in developing UI UX. Uh, compared to even, you know, Nordic banks. So in that sense, because I was about to ask you if you find the competitiveness here in the Nordics being different uh, when you enter this market than compared to, for example, Germany. But then in the end, maybe it's not such a big difference that the banks are a little bit more modern, or what do you say? Uh, I would say they, in Nordics, they're a bit more polished, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that, you know, inside they are modern. <laughs> It's all about the surface, right? Show business, even the financial business. Um, but what about the fintech sector in, in, in Stockholm, in Sweden then? Uh, there are some fairly big companies and some small startups being interesting. I'm personally impressed by a small new um, r robot um, advising company called Fundler, which is, you know, robot advising is something I, I know you've been talking about, but you haven't launched it. You might have it on the roadmap. Um, uh, how do you look upon the fintech um, um, industry in Sweden? Well, I think you have you know, great companies here. Uh, I, I personally you know, admire Klarna, right? Even though they are already not not start up, but I think you know they still achieved a lot. Uh, I know that you also have you know digital challenges. Um, Overall, I think you know ecosystem here is you know very similar to UK and to to Berlin. I think if if we look across the world. Uh, where there are, you know, best ecosystem is obviously, you know, Silicon Valley, but uh, they're not really fintech, right? And uh, they, they're still lagging behind. And then, uh, well, China, obviously, with uh, WeChat, I think, you know, extremely advanced. 
And then uh, finally Europe. In Europe there are only you know, three, three places at the moment, which is uh, London, Berlin, and then Stockholm. And, and those fintechs that you see here, are they competitors or are they possible partners or are they just, you know, building a nice ecosystem that makes you better? Uh, I think we are all together competing against uh, banks, so I, I wouldn't view them as, as competitors, but more like you know uh, the friendly pack. Yeah. So then, talking about banks, what what's if I ask you the long term destiny of traditional banks? What do you think? Well, long term destiny of traditional banks. Uh, I think uh, very sad. <laughs> uh, well, I think reality is uh, um, so large retail banks such as JP Morgan, Citigroup, or HSBC, they will be able to compete because they have a you know, huge uh, balance sheet. So I think you know they will keep a bit of you know retail business. Eighty percent of their business will be a corporate business. I think you know small and mid-sized banks they they will disappear. I think in the world, like in you know, five ten years time, we'll we'll, we'll see you know. Two, three, four, five, you know, huge players who will take in you know, a majority of retail market. We still will will see you know big banks survive, but big banks with uh, with big balance sheet because balance sheet is advantage. Uh, small, medium, local banks. I just don't think they will uh, have a chance. And how long time? How long time? Uh, um, I would say ten, ten years. Right, five. I think it's a bit short. Right, because. Uh, these banking products are very sticky, right? In terms of uh, generation, I think you know, older generation is quite hard to switch, but like you know, younger generation is quite quite easy. It's like we always say. I don't know if Bill Gates and lots of other people said it. You overestimate what happens in one year and underestimate what happens in ten. So I'm, I'm not surprised you say that. Um, so if the banks are not your competitors, who is? Um, well. I would say banks are competitors, right? Uh, but so far, market is so huge, banks are so incompetitive, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't really see competition. I think at later stage we'll see a lot of competition coming from uh, big tech companies such as uh, Amazon, probably, uh, Apple, maybe Google, definitely. So um, let me ask the audience: Who would trust Google? With your money, hands up. Who would trust Apple with your money? Hands up. A bit more for it. And who would trust Amazon? <laughs> so just not very many. Okay, um, I, I see your point because uh, it's kind of a new, uh, obviously, uh, customer contact that you have in the tech industry. Which is different. Uh, coming, talking about trust, I've been looking a little bit into this, and, and there are two. Some people say there are two kinds of trust. The first one is that you trust the bank from actually keeping your money safe, and normally traditional banks can can live up to that. The second kind of trust is will they give you good advice and take care of you, which is another kind of trust. And there, it's not very obvious that traditional banks can live up to that. Um, could you comment on that? And specifically, how do you think that you build trust? For your for your customers, yeah, you're exactly spot on, right? There are, there are two things. One is advice, and one is trust to keep money. So trust to keep money is uh, is uh, extremely hard to build, right? Especially for for new company, and because uh, uh, people who keep money in banks, they keep it uh, in banks because they want this money to be safe, right? And it's quite hard to give this money to tech company. So I think you know we need to do a lot of work on you know trust branding uh, positioning, right? To actually match level of trust that you know traditional old school banks have uh, so that's that's our disadvantage uh, but the advantage is fast uh, well speed obviously you know ability to create better products and then uh, much better pricing compared to banks i think you know what time will be able to to match this level of trust as well so i mean building the brand the second kind of trust is something that you i expect you to be um Better position to build than a traditional bank. Would you? Uh, well, it's uh, reality is people trust institutions who were there for hundred years, right? So in our case, because we were there only for four years, it's quite hard to uh, to compete, right? 
So, but there are certain strategies, certain steps that we can take to, to bring the trust to 100-year-old institutional level. So one interesting technology part, of course, is cryptocurrency in the financial world. Um, um, my first question would be, how, how do you look upon cryptocurrencies? Is it something that could threaten the whole traditional way of doing finance business and replace it all, all actors? Or is it something that would be a, an additional kind of um, opportunity to do things that the traditional financial system cannot do today? Uh, I don't think cryptocurrency will completely disrupt uh, because uh, even if you have a cryptocurrency in the end, you will still need to cash it out in a normal bank account, which is controlled by banks, which are controlled by regulators, right? So unless there is a major shift in uh, uh, regulator mentality, right, about cryptocurrency, I just don't think the um, system would change. So we'll see bits, you know, here and there with cryptocurrency, uh, but unless there is a huge mentality shift, in uh, policy makers and in regulators, uh, I, I don't think we will see you know big change. And looking about these tech companies initiatives like Facebook's Libra and Telegram's Gram, Gram and stuff like that, uh, how do you look upon that? I know you you, you already uh, have some um, services with cryptocurrency within uh, Revolut as well, but that's not your own cryptocurrency. But I mean, how do you look at those, for example, Libra and Gram? Uh, well, I, I like these uh, new things, right? I'm also like an early adopter. I love, you know, any any kind of innovation happening in financial technology markets. But then uh, reality is uh, there is no kind of, you know, mass adoption, right? And mass adoption doesn't happen because there is a quite weak ecosystem, right? And plus, um, regulators, they don't really like, you know, what these companies do. So... We'll, we'll see what happens, but for, for now, I just don't see that uh, that is moving, you know, fast. I guess you could see a trust issue there as well. Facebook's been struggling with trust issues for other reasons, as we all know. Is that you think crucial for for their um, their um, capability of launching a, a new currency like Libra? Yeah, of course. Uh, dealing with money is uh, is not the same as you know just you know keeping your friends right. So, yeah, uh, you first need to have trust. You need to build you know, a very strong brand. Um, and then you know, go from there. And now, um, you recently, the last, um, most recent launch that you did, as we heard before, a stock trade, right? Um, without um, the fees that you normally have for stock trade. Um, I was, I've, I've been looking a little bit at that, at that as well. And I, what I'm curious about, if you think that a digital, digital kind of, evolution of stock trade could eventually kind of do the same thing as crowdfunding uh, could make it possible to have more a more kind of granular um, alternative to traditional IPOs for example you know having funding available 24 7 for small companies uh, modernizing the way we look upon fundraising essentially what do you think yeah, I mean, we, we have the same idea, right? As, uh, whenever we, we look for funding again, we always like think, okay, why, why, why do we need to go to VCs, right? Like, you know, what's, what, what's the point, right? Why, why don't we, we have like, you know, stock trading up within our app, right? Why don't we just, you know, put Revolut stock there and then you know, see uh, how people buy it, right? And avoid the uh, VCs, avoid, you know, investment banks who charge 3 to 5%. Um, so idea is great, right? And we we we, we are looking at it. Um, however, you know there are obviously obstacles in terms of you know regulation, how how you set it all up. But I think you know, overall it will be amazing, right? Imagine yourself you go into stock trading up. There are you know startup companies there, and then your description, right, and some metrics attached to it, and then you you can choose that uh, amount that you want to invest, right, and then see it in the up. At the moment, no one is providing this kind of services. So we've got in the UK uh, someone like Cinders and Crowdcube, but they're uh, rather small and not very advanced in terms of products. So no one yet, you know, build an app where you can, you know, just go inside and, you know, buy uh, startup companies that you like. I, I would definitely use it. I suppose you are using it. <laughs> it's your own. <laughs> so, um, but, um, so if, if we look 10 years ahead, what kind of, would, would stock exchanges as we know them today be very different or what kind of evolution do you expect to see? 
Um, I think in our essence it will be a bit uh, different, right? So I think um, uh, we have you know public markets for stocks and then you know private markets, and then a lot of VCs are actually benefiting from uh, private markets, right? And then it's uh, it's impossible for like you know normal person to to invest in uh, good startups, right? So I think in the future this this bridge uh, there will be a bridge, you know, and uh, the the gap will disappear. I think you know normal people will be able to to invest in companies. I don't know, like IZL, Uber, ADN, pre-APO, not after APO. Now, another obviously great part of um, digitalization today is artificial intelligence and automation. Um, so uh, I was thinking about mostly your own operations. I mean, artificial intelligence could obviously be used for anything like you know, analyzing um, patterns of, of um, transactions, etc., but also for customer care with, uh, um, you know, a language technology in, which is coming very strongly. Um, how do you look upon automation and artificial intelligence within Revolut's oper own operations in, in, in the next future, and how would that affect your organization? I mean, in a huge way. In short, like you know, we we, we use this aspect in almost uh, every part of the business, right? Starting from onboarding, uh, finishing um, offers that we give to to our customers, right? So we have this, you know, beta product called uh, Perks, right? We release it only to one percent customers in uh, UK, and then uh, the way it works. Um, so we obviously uh, see your transactional patterns, right? We know that, you, for example, you like Starbucks or you like Paul, right? And then what we do, uh, based on your allocation and based on your transactional patterns, we send you offers from merchants who want to compete with Starbucks and who want to compete with uh, Paul, right? For example, who's competitor of Starbucks? Say Costa, right? And then uh, if, if we see that you're spending Starbucks every day at 9 a.m., say on your way to work, right? We, and then uh, Costa actually sends you a personalized offer. Okay, if you switch to Costa, right, 50% uh, discount on, on, co on, your, on your morning coffee, right? So this is one thing. Another thing uh, that we released already and you know, it had you know, great success, again, with Perks is, uh, so whenever you uh, book a flight ticket, right, then you, we, we see that you booked a flight ticket and then we immediately send you a push. Hey, Booking.com gives you 10% you know, discount on your, and then you go to Booking.com instead of going to Expedia. So it's good for company, good for for people as well, right? Because because they save money. So that's you know one product. Uh, another product is um, well internal products. We obviously have you know all this you know transactional monitoring, right? This is completely based on anti fraud. This is completely based on uh, machine learning. Uh, third part is customer support. So to give you an idea, uh, mid-sized bank. So mid-sized bank generally has uh, five million customers, right? And they they run uh, ten thousand people customer support team. So we have 7 million customers, and then we run 450 people customer support team because uh, a lot of things are being handled by Rita. So Rita is a Revolut Intelligent Travel Assistant. Again, uh, chatbot. Um, and then the chatbot is answering 40% uh, of questions that people ask. Um, so, and uh, yeah, I can you know, continue continue across uh, departments, but that's, that's the future. So uh, machine learning, you know, these algos, they, they give you ability to uh, automate a lot of things and actually enhance user experience as well. So two follow-up questions to this. And in the overall pictures, obviously, when you don't have fees for uh, currency exchange and for stock trade, um, and you, you have a, um, um, a product with, which is a low-cost product, you got to have a revenue stream anyway. So I imagine that um, lowering the cost with this kind of automation or artificial intelligence is one way of, of you know, um, lowering the costs, essentially, of course, but also these services that you mentioned could give you uh, a, an alternative revenue stream from partners, business partners, is that so? Uh, yeah, exactly. So partnerships as well, like, you know, this uh, marketplace model um, also works for certain uh, products. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work for stock trading, right? Because, I mean, why would you, like, you know, choose, you know, two stock brokers or three stock brokers? It might work for credit. It definitely work for insurance as well, right? Uh, so that's what we are experimenting at the moment. So I think you know, right combination of doing things in house uh, plus having you know one partner 
plus having you know marketplaces is a winning combination. You can never say that you know you either build everything in house or you you do everything from marketplace. There is always kind of a balance, and then you know the level of the balance is determined simply by logic, you know, by by what customer needs and how we provide you know, better and better service, cheaper service and better experience. Second one um, related to automation is uh, the effect on the organization. Now, traditional organizations, incumbent organizations, n normally kind of scared of implementing too much automation because it threatens the job opportunity. Of course, people are, are afraid of losing their jobs. But uh, so I guess that's different in a, in a new organization which is growing. Because, right? um, I, I mean, how. How is the culture, how do people internally, your coworkers, react to automation? Is that a threat or, or a help or an opportunity? Or? Well, in, in, in Revolut, everyone realizes that there's, there's a future, right? Uh, and there is no point to fight the future. It's always in a losing battle. Um, and then uh, teams, they actually, well, understand it, right? And then... Uh, they, they build automation uh, themselves, right? And even, you know, for customer support, right? Uh, when, when people, you know, have a lot of, you know, repetitive things, um, because through automation, uh, through, uh, well, through models, right, we uh, s uh, propose customer support agent to uh, to send the right answer as well. So we give them, like, you know, some some, some tips what, what to answer, right? So they, they also appreciate that they can, you know, help customer, you know, much, much, much quicker. So I think, you know, Inside inside uh, the company, we're all on board that you know automation is the way forward. Obviously, like in other banks, there might be you know certain population of employees who might be afraid of you know losing job because of automation. Although I must say that uh, Swedish bank ACB was one of the first to use um, um, the um, conversation agent called Emilia, if you know that from IPsoft, which is a very advanced chat bot. Uh, agent and I heard actually internally that they were really happy with implementing that kind of technology because uh, you know as exactly as you say you you can go away from doing those repetitive 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 tasks that are really boring. So looking a little bit ahead, you're expanding now in a few markets. Um, what you didn't mention next was the Chinese market that I'm really curious about. Uh, what 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 uh, what do you think about your opportunities or ability to um, to go into the Chinese market with, I mean, with Tencent and Alibaba, and those really strong competitors. And I think we have advantage, right? So obviously not for local China, but like you know, um, so Chinese are number one travelers now in the world. So if you go to Harris, I don't know on the weekend, <laughs> you understand you know, what, what I'm saying, right? Um, and then I, I think we have advantage, right? Because we provide effectively a cr cross cross border currency services, right? Which will be an extremely beneficial for Chinese tourists. It's number one. Number two, there is uh, uh, another project that we're working on at the moment, um, which is called uh, Digital VAT Refund, right? So it, it's a actually amazing product. So imagine you're a Chinese tourist, you go into London, you spend uh, in in Harris, I don't know, one thousand five hundred pounds, buying yourself some some fancy bag, right? And then we automatically refund 20%, right? Because we can see that, okay, you came from China, right? We can see um, VAT, 20% on transaction, right? And then we can digitally claim it with HMRC, which is uh, which is a British uh, tax agency, right? And then we refund. So this experience is kind of, you know, unbeaten, right? By, 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 by Chinese rivals, I think they're a bit behind. Yes, they're very strong, you know, locally, but like, you know, more like international experiences, uh, they don't know that yet. So, when do you think you could enter the Chinese market? It's a very provocative question. So, I I, I remember like two years ago, I was saying uh, we will enter you know U.S. market like in, within six months, right? Uh, so we're still like you know not there so two years. So China can be you know, even more challenging than U.S. Sometime, my answer. Yeah. So, would it be the last? large market to enter in that sense that it's the most challenging market maybe? Uh, but the opportunity is also huge, right? Yes, uh, costs to launch are high, but opportunity is huge. So I don't think it will be a last in prioritization. So China maybe you know third wave, third, third wave, how we call it. So we will launch in waves. Coming back to the trust um, aspect, uh, trust is very different in different countries, uh, parts of the world. And I mean, it's in some the U.S. and the Western world, it's very much about um, uh, it's professional trust. I trust you because I know you do good things. Whereas in, in Asia and in, in, in the um, 
uh, Arab world, uh, it's more like I've got to feel that you're a trustable person. I got some personal relationship to you in business. I mean, it's more important than the contract, actually. Sometimes some people say that if you, if you, the first thing they do is pulling up a contract, an agreement, and you want to sign it, they say, well, don't you trust me? That, that's kind of an offense that you need a, an agreement to, to build trust. So it's very difficult to trust in different cultures, and you probably know that um, from your background as well and, you know, in Russia. So how, uh, does that affect your operations when you try to build trust in a new market? Do you think from, uh, about this cultural aspect? Yeah, we definitely see uh, market for market, you know, there are different levels of trust, right? Uh, it's simply, uh, like in some markets, people uh, are not afraid to use new products. In some markets, people just, you know, don't trust new engines, they, they don't use it. And it, it greatly varies, you know, country by country, culture by culture. Uh, but I guess it's, it's a given for us, right? So we, we, we operate with uh, what we have. Um, just one thing going back to yourself. You were trained as a physicist and you were a swimmer, comp competing as well. Uh, did that help you, you think, building a company? Anything of those two things? Uh, yeah, definitely, right? So, uh, well, studying physics. So studying you know, theoretical physics is, is definitely like, you know, uh, teaches you structured thinking, right? And the ability to actually dig down, you know, understand where reality is, right? And how different parts of reality, you know, are connected with each other. It's extremely important. Uh, and being, you know, uh, well, competitive swimmer, then, you know, generally, like, you know, competing in sports, or, well, teaches you how to win effectively, how to be number one, how to be aggressive, how to reach your goals. So I think this is a... a very important for entrepreneurs this, to have you know this kind of uh, combination, so being having you no know, structured thinking, plus uh, some kind of you know, competitiveness and aggressiveness. Sounds kind of the ultimate combination. Maybe that's the the clue to a Revolut's um, um, success. So the last question, of course, would be where will Revolut be in five years from now? Uh, well, truly global bank. Right, my, my, my answer. That, that's our mission, that's our goal, to, to, to become a truly global bank. So no, no one has done it before, uh, but uh, we were here to try. So uh, that was all for me. I think we got some other questions, but thank you very much for that. First, um, do we have some, yeah, here we go. Oh, I will try to read your nice uh, questions here. Um, right. Uh, yeah, we can start with this because I forgot to talk about your banking license. You actually acquired a banking license in Lithuania that you still haven't started using, if I'm right. So what are your plans for the banking license? So basically the strategy for, 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 for the group is that uh, we operationalize in a banking license in Lithuania. We roll it out um, across our Eastern Europe, Central Europe for Western Europe, and uh, so we applying for Irish banking license, and then for UK, provided there is hard Brexit, we're also applying for British banking license, so that's for, for business in Europe. Apart from it, we're applying in, um, uh, for banking license in Australia now, and then for, for, for US. So generally, where, uh, where we enter every country, we, we're getting a banking license. And that's, of course, connected also to your ability to give credit. So someone here is asking, will you be introducing credit cards? Yeah, so that's another team. Well, I would say now a department, right, that works on credit. And part of the department works on credit cards, which we were going to introduce in December. Um, Right, this one, will you implement, the, you know, the Swedish bank ID, you know that one, of course, uh, owned by the major banks, and the Swish um, mobile payment system, also owned by the banks. Will you implement some of those, or any connections with those? Yeah, so part of our product localization product uh, program, uh, so we will uh, be doing it, right? It will either be done uh, centrally in London or we are going to hire a product team here on the ground to actually localize product for, for market needs. We, we haven't decided yet. Now this is a um, kind of interesting startup question. We've been touching um, some of these arguments before, but topics before, but how do you manage to build new features so fast? Now, I mean, grow so fast and develop so fast and still keep the quality high? Well, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, right, so we, we 
well, build this model when we have you know, a startup and then you know, start building you know, startups uh, within startup. I think the key is to hire uh, strong founders, right, to, to, to run these startups. We call them product owners. Um, so that's a key difference. Do you use AI when you pick people? <laughs> I try to build this here, not AI, but like you know, some uh, uh, simple model, right? And then uh, initially it was like you know, just set the questions, and then uh, around these questions across uh, our whole organization, because I knew who is top performer, who is not, right? I, I could mesh, I could uh, find some statistical evidence. So some things are there, right? So you can really use it, um, but reality, uh, it's scientifically, it's not uh, cannot be used. Right yet, but I think you know with, within two, three, four, five years time there will be companies who provide you know these, these services because there is definitely like a huge untapped opportunity in actually evaluating people and matching people to the right jobs. I think is so important. Um, using simple statistics, that's interesting that you mentioned, especially as you're a physicist. Uh, if you haven't read Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman, please do that. It's an amazing book. Um, one of the takeaways is that normally uh, a simple algorithm is better than human judgment in very many situations because it's consistent <laughs> every time. Um, here's one question. What actions has increased Revolut's usage or customer base the most? And this uh, person think it was the introduction of Apple Pay. Could you comment on that? Uh, in some markets, definitely, right, especially in the, in the smaller markets like, you know, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Eastern Europe. So I think, you know, we were the first to introduce Apple Pay there. It definitely helped uh, increase usage. In in other markets, uh, when we introduced cryptocurrency, we acquired a lot of people back, 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 back in the days when cryptocurrency was popular. Um, in some countries, it was trading as well. Um, but it, it, it really depends on the country. So let's finish with this one, which is similar, but you could uh, answer it kind of uh, again. Um, how do you plan to outpace competitors so, who so far appear to provide similar services? Well, if we start comparing, you know, likes for likes, so you will see the travel at, you know, providing you know, more services. Um, and then we will continue doing it the same way, right? So continue, you know, to deliver new products super fast and, you know, of high quality. And that's, I guess, the only way to, to beat competition, right? To, to outperform them on uh, product quality. So um, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. Really interesting talking to you. Really interesting to hear your answers and tell you about how to, use to build this fast growing company. Uh, will you please give Nikolai a great applause? <laughs> And I would say thank you, and I'll hand over the mic to uh, Hannah. Thank you so much.